Lesson 5, Welcome to Lesson 5 of the Food Handler Safety Course, provided by Texas Best Food Services Training. This lesson will cover cleaning and sanitizing. Cleaning versus Sanitization It is important to know that cleaning and sanitization are different terms and the processes cannot be used interchangeably. Cleaning is a process that removes food or other types of soil from surfaces like countertops, and plates. Sanitization, on the other hand, is utilized to reduce the number of microorganisms on that clean surface to levels that are safe. Both cleaning and sanitizing can be done with either heat or chemicals. Cleaning and sanitizing equipment and utensils First, it is important to know that all equipment and utensils should be cleaned to the site and to the touch. Food contact surfaces Food contact surfaces of cooking equipment and pans should be kept free from encrusted grease deposits and any other soil accumulation. Non-food contact surfaces, these should be kept free from any dust, dirt, food residue, and other debris. When to clean and sanitize equipment food contact surfaces and utensils must be cleaned, unless otherwise specified before use with a different type of raw animal food such as beef, fish, lamb, pork, or poultry, between uses with raw fruits and vegetables and with potentially hazardous food, before using or storing a food temperature measuring device, at any point where contamination may occur. Cooking and baking equipment must be cleaned, at least every 24 hours on food contact surfaces. Note. This does not apply to hot oil cooking and filtering equipment the cavities and door seals of microwaves must be cleaned at least every 24 hours. Use manufacturer's recommended cleaning method. For non-food contact surfaces, these must be cleaned at a frequency necessary to preclude accumulation of soil residues. Methods of cleaning, dry cleaning, brushing, scraping, and vacuuming only used on surfaces that have dry food residue, not to be used on surfaces that are potentially hazardous. Cleaning equipment used for dry cleaning cannot be used for any other purposes. 7. Pre-cleaning, food debris on utensils and equipment must be scraped over a waste disposal unit or garbage area or removed in a wear washing machine with a pre-wash cycle. If necessary, these materials must be pre-flushed, pre-soaked, or scrubbed with abrasives. Loading of soiled items, soiled items that are to be cleaned in a wear washing machine must be loaded onto racks, trays, or baskets or onto conveyors so that, the items are exposed to unobstructed spray from all cycles, and the items should be allowed to drain wet cleaning, equipment or utensils on food contact surfaces must be effectively washed to remove or completely loosen any soils. May be done mechanically or manually. Detergents containing wetting agents and emulsifiers, acid, alkaline or abrasive cleaners, hot water, brushes, scouring pads, high pressure spray. Washing process will be determined by the type of purpose the equipment or utensil serves and the type of soil that needs to be removed. Methods of sanitization Sanitization can be accomplished through two means. Hot water and chemical. After being cleaned, equipment that involves food contact surfaces and utensils needs to be sanitized in hot water by manual immersion for at least 30 seconds, hot water mechanical operations, cycled through equipment. Utensil surface temperature should reach 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Chemical, manual, or mechanical operations, sanitizing equipment and utensils by immersion. Manual swabbing, brushing, and pressure spraying. Sanitization exposure times, chlorine solution, at least 10 seconds in a chlorine solution of 50 mg per liter, with a pH of 10 or less, and a temperature of at least 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or at least 7 seconds a pH of 8 or less and a temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Some sources say a chlorine solution of between 50 and 99 ppm in water that is at least 70 degrees, warm, for 10 seconds. This is simpler if you don't have a degree in chemistry. Other chemical sanitizing solutions, 
at least 30 seconds. An exposure time should be used in relationship with a combination of temperature, concentration, and pH. It doesn't take much. Sanitizers are often abused. Not enough sanitizer is a health hazard and too much is a chemical hazard. Add little by little and test it until it is in the proper range. Testing kits are available to determine the amount of sanitizers in the water, measured in ppm or parts per million stated above. The manufacturer will state their recommendations on the sanitizing container, and must be followed. Take a strip, write the date and time on it, you will learn this when the health department comes in for an inspection and asks to see your test strips. If your sanitizing sink has brown water in it, you can expect this to happen, then dip it in your sanitizing water for a couple of seconds. Then compare the color of the strip to the chart on the bottle of strips. Put the strip in a safe place. Not the trash can. Making sure sanitizers are effective, there are different sanitizers. The concentration of the solution when in the water will determine its effectiveness the temperature of the water, and the length of time that the sanitizer comes into contact with the surface or equipment will also determine its effectiveness. Sanitizers that are used must always be EPA registered. Test kits are required by the FDA food code and agencies that inspect your facility. In the food industry, chlorine and ammonium sanitizers are often the most commonly used. Take note that all chemical sanitizers have their own ups and downs. Smell, staining, cost, effects, and potential for skin irritation. Ask a chemical supplier to help you make the right choice for your establishment. Three compartment sinks A sink with at least three compartments shall be provided for manually washing, rinsing, and sanitizing equipment and utensils. With approval. Alternate manual wear washing equipment may be used when there are special cleaning needs or constraints. Sink compartments shall be large enough to accommodate immersion of the largest equipment and utensils. If equipment or utensils are too large for the wear washing sink, a wear washing machine or alternative equipment shall be used. These sinks are generally used to manually wash things such as pots, pans, utensils, and bar glassware. Three compartment sinks are designed for the specific process of washing, rinsing, and sanitizing. Start by cleaning and sanitizing each sink and all work surfaces. Sink 1, fill with water at least 110 degrees F. Add detergent. Sink 2, fill with water or leave the sink empty if you spray rinse items. Sink 3, fill with water. Add sanitizer as described by manufacturer and above. Check the strength of the sanitizer. Steps for cleaning and sanitizing items in a three-compartment sink, rinse, scrape, or soak the items before washing them. Clean the items in the first sink. Use a brush, cloth, or nylon scrub pad to loosen dirt. Change the water when the suds are gone or the water is dirty. Rinse the items in the second sink. Dip them in the water or spray rinse them. Remove any food or detergent. Change the water when it becomes dirty or full of suds. Sanitize the items in the third sink. Soak them in a sanitizer solution as described above. Never rinse the items after sanitizing them. This could contaminate the surfaces. Air dry the items. Place them upside down so that they will drain. Do not wipe them dry. Cleaning in place, for items which cannot be conveniently taken to a three-compartment sink for cleaning, cleaning in place is used. Examples are ovens, microwave ovens, kitchen area countertops, and walk-in cooler walls. All areas in a restaurant must look clean and sanitary and be clean and sanitary. A customer will not return to a restaurant which does not look clean. And if a restaurant is not clean and sanitary could easily lead to a foodborne disease outbreak. Kitchen, prep areas, and serving areas especially. Directions for cleaning in place, remove visible contaminants with a pre-wash. This may include scrubbing dried foods, or baked on foods 
such as inside of an oven, from a surface. This may even include approved chemical cleaners to loosen the contaminant. Wash the area with a soapy solution as detailed in the above section. Rinse the area with clean water. Sanitize the area with a solution as detailed above. Storing cleaning supplies. Cleaning supplies and equipment must be stored so they do not contaminate food, equipment, utensils, linens, and single-service and single-use articles, and stored in an orderly manner that facilitates cleaning the area used for storing the maintenance tools. The premise shall be free from items that are unnecessary to the operation or maintenance of the establishment such as equipment that is non-functional or no longer used, and litter. Mechanical wear washing equipment, wash solution temperature, mechanical wear washing equipment, dishwashers, must be maintained by a schedule stated by the manufacturer. The temperature of the wash solution in spray type wear washers that use hot water to sanitize may not be less than, for a stationary rack, single temperature machine 165 F. For a stationary rack, dual temperature machine 150 F. For a single tank, conveyor, dual temperature machine, 160 degrees F or for a multi-tank, conveyor, multi-temperature machine 150 degrees F. The temperature of the wash solution in spray type wear washers that use chemicals to sanitize may not be less than 120 degrees F. If immersion in hot water is used for sanitizing in a manual operation, the temperature of the water shall be maintained at 171 F or above. In a mechanical operation, the temperature of the fresh hot water sanitizing rinse as it enters the manifold may not be more than 194 F. Stationary rack, single temperature machine, 165 F, or all other machines 180 F. The maximum temperature specified above does not apply to the high pressure and temperature systems with one type, handheld, spraying devices used for the in-place cleaning and sanitizing of equipment such as meat saws. The flow pressure of the fresh hot water sanitizing rinse in a wear washing machine, as measured in the water line immediately downstream or upstream from the fresh hot water sanitizing rinse control valve, shall be specified on the machine manufacturer's data plate and may not be less than 35 kPa, 5 pounds per square inch, or more than 200 kPa, 30 pounds per square inch. A chemical sanitizer used in a sanitizing solution for a manual or mechanical operation shall meet the criteria in 228.206, A, of this title, relating to chemicals, and shall be used in accordance with the EPA-approved manufacturer's label and use instructions, and shall be used as follows, A chlorine solution shall have a minimum temperature based on the concentration and pH of the solution as listed in the following chart. An iodine solution shall have a minimum temperature of 68 F. And pH of 5.0 or less or a pH no higher than the level for which the manufacturer specifies the solution is effective, and concentration between 12.5 mg per liter and 25 mg per liter. A quaternary ammonium compound solution shall have a minimum temperature of 75 F and have a concentration as specified earlier and as indicated by the manufacturer's use directions included in the labeling and be used only in water with 500 mg per liter, hardness, or less or in water having a hardness no greater than specified by EPA registered label use instructions. If another solution of a chemical specified above in this subsection is used, the permit holder shall demonstrate to the regulatory authority that the solution achieves sanitization and the use of the solution shall be approved, or if a chemical sanitizer other than chlorine, iodine, or an ammonium compound is used, it shall be applied in accordance with the EPA registered label use instructions. If a chemical sanitizer is generated by a device located on site at the food establishment it shall be used as specified above in this subsection and shall be produced by a device that complies with regulation as specified in the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act and complies with requirements for devices and labeling requirements. Displays the EPA device manufacturing facility registration number on the device, and is operated and maintained in accordance with manufacturer's instructions.
If a detergent sanitizer is used to sanitize in a cleaning and sanitizing procedure where there is no distinct water rinse between the washing and sanitizing steps, the agent applied in the sanitizing step shall be the same detergent sanitizer that is used in the washing step. Concentration of the sanitizing solution shall be accurately determined by using a test kit or other device. Pest Control in food processing environments, quality pest control is a must. A pest infestation can put your product and your business reputation at risk because nobody wants to find something in the product that's not on the label. But pest management in such environments is also very sensitive. Special precautions must be taken to keep pest control treatments from threatening food safety. To better control pests while respecting a food plant's sensitive environmental needs, you need to apply the principles of Integrated Pest Management, IPM. IPM programs are successful for a simple reason. They recognize that pest management is a process, not a one-time event, and that relying solely on chemical controls when so many other tools are available is never the best solution. By addressing the underlying causes of pest infestations access to food, water, and shelter, Integrated pest management can prevent infestation before pesticides are even considered. In practice, IPM is an ongoing cycle of seven critical steps. Step 1, Inspection The cornerstone of an effective IPM program is a schedule of regular inspections. For food processors, weekly inspections are common, and some plants inspect even more frequently. These routine inspections should focus on areas where pests are most likely to appear, receiving docks, storage areas, employee break rooms, and sites of recent ingredient spills and identify any potential entry points, food and water sources, or harborage zones that might encourage pest problems. Step 2, Preventive Action, as regular inspections reveal vulnerabilities in your pest management program, take steps to address them before they cause a real problem. One of the most effective prevention measures is exclusion, that is, performing structural maintenance to close potential entry points revealed during inspection. By physically keeping pests out, you can reduce the need for chemical countermeasures. Likewise, sanitation and housekeeping will eliminate potential food and water sources, thereby reducing pest pressure. Step 3. Identification Different pests have different behaviors. By identifying the problematic species, pests can be eliminated more efficiently and with the least risk of harm to other organisms. Professional pest management always starts with the correct identification of the pest in question. Make sure your pest control provider undergoes rigorous training in pest identification and behavior. Step 4. Analysis Once you have properly identified the pest, you need to figure out why the pest is in your facility. Is there food debris or moisture accumulation that may be attracting it? What about odors? How are the pests finding their way in a euro perhaps through the floors or walls? Could incoming shipments be infested? The answers to these questions will lead to the best choice of control techniques. Step 5. Treatment Selection IPM stresses the use of non-chemical control methods, such as exclusion or trapping, before chemical options. When other control methods have failed or are inappropriate for the situation, chemicals may be used in least volatile formulations in targeted areas to treat the specific pest. In other words, use the right treatments in the right places, and only as much as you need to get the job done. Often, the right treatment will consist of a combination of responses from chemical treatments to baiting to trapping. But by focusing on non-chemical options first, you can ensure that your pest management program is effectively eliminating pests at the least risk to your food safety program, non-target organisms, and the environment. Ya will also see higher pest control scores at audit time. Step 6. Monitoring. Since pest management is an ongoing process, Constantly monitoring your facility for pest activity and facility and operational changes can protect against infestation and help eliminate existing ones. Since your pest management
management professional most likely visits your facility on a bi-weekly or weekly basis, your staff needs to be the daily eyes and ears of the IPM program. Employees should be cognizant of sanitation issues that affect the program and should report any signs of pest activity. You do not want to lose a day when it comes to reacting to an actual pest presence. Step 7, Documentation, Let's face it. The food safety auditor's visit can make or break your business. Since pest control can account for up to 20% of your total score, it is therefore imperative that your IPM program is ready to showcase come audit time. Up-to-date pest control documentation is one of the first signs to an auditor that your facility takes pest control seriously. Important documents include a scope of service, pest activity reports, service reports, corrective action reports, trap layout maps, lists of approved pesticides, pesticide usage reports and applicator licenses. Pesticides, rodent bait shall be contained in a covered, tamper-resistant bait station. Tracking powders, pest control and monitoring. Except as specified in paragraph, 2, of this subsection, a tracking powder pesticide may not be used in a food establishment. If used, a non-toxic tracking powder such as talcum or flour that does not contaminate food, equipment, utensils, linens, and single-service and single-use articles. End of Lesson 5 We recommend downloading the PDF of this lesson for reference and study.